One of the things that I noticed, Rebecca, is that you're a down-the-line strong progressive on all the issues that you're running on, Medicare for All, a Green New Deal. And I wonder how you see that taking root and being acceptable to the voters of the 6th Congressional District. In other words, what's the 6th Congressional District like? Talk a little bit about the people who live there and what you're hearing about that progressive agenda and how it has resonance for people in the district. Yeah, that's a great question, Jonathan, because it's really important that the policies help the people of my district. And uh, you know, nationally, we're talking about these progressive policies, but are they what's best for the people here? And in my experience, going around talking to people, observing the conditions, and then just how it is in my own life and um, things that I've been dealing with, absolutely, it's a great fit for the people in the district. So Medicare for all, because particularly we have an addiction issue across the entire district, like in a lot of the country. And we have uh, in one county in my district, there was recently a report came out in the paper that over a six year period, um, people were prescribed an average of 76 addictive pills per person per year. And now that county has the highest opioid death rate in the state, which is no coincidence. And we don't have enough treatment and detox facilities. For example, in Tacoma, there's only one facility that takes Medicaid for detox in Grays Harbor County, which is a pretty low-income, struggling uh, county in my district, used to have a big timber industry that collapsed, and now there's just no jobs. There's a lot of addiction. And actually, the Poor People's Campaign that's uh, spearheaded by um, Reverend William Barber, um, they have a Washington State chapter. It's very active in Grays Harbor County. And there's a priest there who ministers to people who stay in camp- homeless encampment there. And she has tattooed on her arm initials of everyone who's died waiting in line for treatment. And so that's where I see Medicare for All being really, really big in my district is for addiction, um, alcoholism, and drug addiction. We just don't have the we don't have enough resources and support and facilities for people who want to get clean and sober, and then ongoing support to stay clean and sober. You know, some people need a month, some people need three months in rehab, and we really need to have that as part of Medicare for All. And then in terms of the Green New Deal, that's a huge issue. I was actually out with a group that was canvassing in rural Washington, and I was out with them in Grace Harbor County, and their mission is to make sure that the Green New Deal benefits rural Washington and not just the cities. So we went around to people asking, uh, talking to them about the Green New Deal, and we, <clears throat> some people would voluntarily, we didn't ask them, they would tell us who they had voted for uh, president. Some of them said they had voted for Trump, and um, even those people, we would show them and say, well, here's what a green, the Green New Deal is and what it aims to do. And then just looking at this list of policies, which would you uh, would be most important to you to have be part of the Green New Deal? And they were all extremely progressive policies, like uh, <clears throat> more uh, federal jobs guarantee with living wage union jobs, free college, free trade school, uh, free child care so that you can work and not have half your paycheck go to child care, that kind of thing, and just a long list of these. And even Trump voters looked at it and said, well, I don't know. It's hard to say because I really like all of them. (laughs) Uh So, you know, my district is very working class. It's basically blue. We have not had a Republican representative since the 1960s. It's a D plus six district. Um, It went for Bernie in the caucuses. And so it's a very safe Democratic district. It's also very working class. It's not, you know, it's just south of Seattle, south and west of Seattle. But it's very different from Seattle. We do not have the tech sector here. We have a lot of people do, uh, working blue collar, working class jobs, and then in a large large parts of the district, there just aren't enough jobs, and they don't pay enough what what you can find. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned Bernie winning that district, and it kind of connects to the point you just made that if you go and talk to Trump voters, that if you talk, or frankly any voters, if you talk about the actual issues that the issues that Bernie ran on, and, and you may know that I was a, a surrogate for Bernie in 2016 and traveled mm-hmm. and, and spoke about these issues a lot, and I found the same thing that if you just talk to people about the issues and you took away the label Republican, Democrat independent, there was huge majority support for the specific issues. If you just said, hey, do you support the idea that we're not going to kill the planet? Do you support the idea that we're not going to let insurance companies basically bankrupt people? There's always majority support for that. And so how, my question now to you as someone running, how do you convert that to people saying, I'm going to vote for Rebecca in the primary? 
Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that it is, it's very possible to talk to people. I've had these conversations where we just talk about the issues and something I've noticed among progressive Democrats and people who voted for Trump, um, particularly people in working class areas, is when you start talking about, you know, who's responsible for this? Why are we suffering this way? And uh, the common answer will be corrupt politicians, corporations, uh, greedy CEOs, uh, billionaires, you know, rigging the economy to work for themselves, that kind of thing. You know, these policies and the diagnosis of the reason that we have the problems we have are supported by a majority of the population. It's the corporate, uh, it's the corporate Democrats and corporate Republicans who don't see it. Um, but really, they're the fringe opinion. And so for myself, it would be talking to people and saying, like, look, we have this to Democrats, you know, he's, um, the Washington State Democratic Party is very progressive. We have a very progressive platform. It calls for single payer health care among other progressive policies, yet he doesn't support it. So I would say to them, like, hey, look, you know, look at the Democratic Party platform and look at me, what I support, and then look at how he votes and the money he takes, that kind of thing. And then to people who are uh, independent or Republican or progressive Democrats, I would say, this is about the issues, you know. I'm the one who is going to fight to get money out of politics, to end corruption, to make sure that insurance companies aren't getting in between you and your doctor and that it's not some it's not somebody at a for profit company deciding whether you live or die because this claim is covered or not. Um, so that you're able to go to the doctor if you like and get the care you need when you need it. And then also I'm the one who's gonna really fight for a federal jobs guarantee because one thing that's um, popular across uh, Democrats and Republicans in this district is they love um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and uh, I just went to a, I just went to a Democrat fund Democratic fundraiser. It was called the Roosevelt Dinner. It was for him. And then I have a friend who grew up on the Olympic Peninsula. His entire family, a lot of his friends are Republican. He's a Bernie crat. And um, he said that you know the only. Um, political shrine in the small town, more like a village that he grew up in. Um, there's only there's a shrine to only one politician, and it's in the Elk Lodge, uh, and it's to FDR. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. In this small Republican town. There are there are Roosevelt dinners, I think, probably in every state and probably in most cities that happen throughout the years. That has been something that has taken hold and never left the time of FDR. He still is a beloved figure um, among many people. And to your point, he's beloved beyond ideology. It's because people, especially if you think about older people, they know that social security, that the fact that they're not starving and eating dog food is thanks to FDR. And you can go just down the list and you can look at all the things that were passed during the, the New Deal that he was responsible for, or at least he certainly was the champion. And I think it's important to remind everyone that it wasn't just one person. There was a movement at that time for those issues in the same way that people are trying to build a movement now to basically hold even the best politician accountable to a movement that demands either the, the Green New Deal or certainly Medicare for all. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's an important piece as well as Social Security, because uh, my district skews a bit older. And to me, it's really important to link the fact that, you know, this progressive movement, this populist movement is not about, it benefits the young, like free college and not having people graduate with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, all of that, but it benefits people of all ages. You know, part of my platform is expanding social security because there are seniors in my district who are struggling to get by on eight or nine hundred dollars a month and having to choose between paying for housing, paying for groceries or paying for prescriptions. And, you know, we talk I was raised with respecting your elders, and that's what you're supposed to do and, and treat people with respect, especially your elders. Well, respecting our elders is not letting, not letting them live in poverty and have to choose between the essentials and, well, should I get my heart medication or should I buy groceries? I mean, that's not respect. And I think that um, these progressive policies are really about showing respect. Like, if you need health care, you get health care, period. And if you're a senior, you should be able to live in your retirement with dignity and comfort and ease and be treated well by society because we value you. And it's really for people of all ages, these progressive policies are for. 
And I want to ask you another question about the Green New Deal. And I, I want to say to my listeners that there's a whole raft of Rebecca's proposals that you can read on her website at Rebecca4, that's F-O-R-W-A.com. That's Rebecca4WA.com. And she has a whole list of progressive um, proposals. But the thing that was interesting to me about the Green New Deal is a part where you talk about the Green New Deal potentially creating millions of good $15 an hour union jobs to ensure prosperity and economic security. And one of the points that we've made on this program, that I've made on this program repeatedly, is that it's a great thing to call out and demand $15 an hour as a minimum wage compared to the poverty minimum wage that we have now. But really, if you look at how much productivity has increased over the last 30 or 40 years, the minimum wage should be at least $20 an hour. And especially when you're talking about union jobs, and you probably know this, I, I know that you're a great union supporter from looking at your agenda uh, for union rights, union jobs, good union jobs have paid a lot more per hour, not to mention that they have health care and pensions. So I'm wondering whether we're actually shortchanging our call for uh, the New Deal in terms of the kinds of jobs we're looking for in terms of what they're going to pay for. Yeah, I think that 15, you know, fight for 15, that was a good place to start. And it's really easy to remember. But, you know, we started that fight for 15, you know, so many years ago that <laughs> at this point, $15 per hour is no longer sufficient in many places or maybe even most places. And so I think $15 should be an absolute minimum, just a floor, but that the minimum wage should be uh, tied so that somebody working 40 hours a week at minimum wage does not have to spend more than 30% of their income on average housing costs for the area. So that I really think it should be tied to that because so many, especially renters in this country and in my district are overburdened and they're paying over 50% of their income on rent, which means, you know, millennials are having fewer children. Um, they're buying houses later. You know, there's just so many cascading effects. Mm -hmm. And so a few more questions, and I kind of want to move to the mechanics of the campaign, actually ask you a few things about what it's like to be a candidate, because I think a lot of my listeners, some of them would like to run for office. And it's always good to hear from people who perhaps are running for office for the first time or certainly for a federal office. So what was your thought process in coming to the decision to run for office. And I know that part of it is, God, we've got this guy in right now who's terrible. He's not progressive. But in a concrete way, you woke up one day, you started thinking about it. I, I assume you had to make a little bit of a list and say, OK, I'm going to have to give up this. I'm not going to be able to do this. There's a financial cost. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, because that's, that's something that I really enjoyed hearing about from other people running. You know, AOC did a lot of kind of behind the scenes stuff that I really appreciated. And it's, um, it's a really an experience becoming a candidate. <laughs> you know, you do have to take into account that, you know, your life becomes much more public. You're a public figure. You um, don't have the expectations of privacy as much as you did as when you were a private citizen. And thinking about running. I had been thinking about it for a couple of years. And then particularly when Donald Trump was elected, it seemed to me, well, if he can get elected president, you know, definitely it helps that he's rich and he was able to fund a lot of it. But um, I think if he can, then I can definitely get elected to something and help my community that way. And then my family also has a tradition of public service. I just wasn't, I wanted to continue that, but I wasn't sure how. Uh, my grandfather was in the in the military for his career in the army. My dad was a foreign service officer, so I landed on running for office. I took a candidate training, and the traditional way of going about it is that you have to have a lot of connections. You need to have rich friends. You need to have a list that you can call and know that you'll be able to raise a bunch of money from the, that list of people you know. And then you know, just spend, take your time and work your way up. Like get on some boards and commissions, run for some smaller positions, and go up that way. And then I started seeing people like AOC winning, uh, knock down the house. Like I started seeing this groundswell of candidates. Uh, Carrie Eastman in Nebraska, who is a social worker, first time candidate, they came very close to winning the Democratic primary in Nebraska against a, I believe, a DCCC endorsed. Um, Democrat. So I just saw all these signs that, you know, the old model isn't necessarily true. But I also thought, what's actually best for the district? You know, our incumbent is the ninth most conservative Democrat in the House. 
He's the chair of the New Democrats Coalition, which is the centrist corporate conservative wing of the Democratic Party. And as such, you know, he takes money from big pharma, including from a PAC that's funded by people who, by companies that created the opioid epidemic that is devastating our district. You know, this is not somebody who has, who I think is ever going to come out for Medicare for All, so far has refused to, and the Green New Deal as well. And it's like there are people, it sounds hyperbolic, um, but it's true is that there are people dying every day because we don't have single payer Medicare for all. And then as well with the Green New Deal and our 2030 climate deadline, it's like somebody needs to get in there and beat him. And whoever it is, it's going to be me. And I'm going to do that traditional path. It's, that takes like 20 years. We're way past the climate deadline by the time that happens. And so I decided to just run and do that. And then in terms of what it's like being a candidate, it's kind of bizarre because it's a lot easier than I thought it would be to just file. <laughs> you know, you just go to the FEC's website, you file, it's done in a couple minutes, and then all of a sudden you're a federal candidate. Obviously, there's a lot more to it um, running and winning a campaign than that, but it was pretty bizarre because I filed with the FEC. It was a matter of minutes, and then I went to the gym. <laughs> and, <laughs> and being a federal candidate, it was I so like, weird. I like your priorities, however, <laughs> as a gym person myself, that you filed and then you went to the gym. Very good. And and I hope yeah. I hope you're keeping your gym schedule no matter how hard the campaign is going because you got to take care of your physical body because it helps your your mindset. I remember that running for as a candidate myself. And so you mentioned the DCCC. And so that immediately made me think, how much guff have you gotten from the insiders about, and I'm just generally saying, because I've talked to other progressive candidates who are running in primaries against bad Democrats, they get the line, you know, why are you doing this now? We have to be united. You know, the, the rubbish that you hear. I'm sure you've gotten some mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah, I do get that. Why are you running? And, you know, if I ever talk about if when I talk about my opponent's record and the way he's voted, they say that I'm bashing him. And it's not I mean, it's just the typical line. You know, you're not allowed to talk about somebody's voting record because that's, you know, being mean and not being not showing unity or whatever. But, you know, the unity thing only goes one way. They want to destroy progressives, but we're supposed to just kind of meekly fold our hands and, and, you know, let them like crush us. I don't, the unity only goes one way. And I have gotten that, you know, the DCCC ban has affected me. I met with an organizer who was recommended to me by my treasurer and she was great, very friendly, very capable. I thought she would be a great person to have on my campaign. And she said, you know, I met with you in person because I wanted to tell you in person that, um, you know, I work for an agency that has, she works for an agency that has an incumbent as a client um, in a different district, not my opponent. Uh, And so because of that, you know, Nancy Pelosi told them, you know, because of the DCCC blacklist, told this client that they have, um, you can't hire an agency that works with people challenging incumbents. And uh, she can only, this organizer can only do work through her agency. So that meant that I was just off limits. She can't work on my campaign. And so it's even affecting me, you know, this rule that they created, the DCCC in Washington, D.C. is affecting me all the way over here in a coffee shop in Tacoma meeting with a local organizer. And then the other thing that's happened is that the state Democratic Party has denied me access to Zan and their tools. And, um, you know, just to protect the incumbent, he raises a lot of money for them. And so I'm finding some workarounds, but I was kind of expecting it, but I did ask just so that I could get the answer and the answer was no. <laughs> I, I find that um, astonishing and I, I not that anything shocks me in terms of the establishment Democrats, but the fact that you're running as a Democrat, that you're running and you're accepted, you filed with the FEC, you're doing all the right things and that they can actually ban you from using the tools to talk to voters, essentially, to know who your voters are, that that's incredibly uh, undemocratic and just it's an outrage. And it, you're not the only candidate that has had to face that, but that speaks to the deep corruption in the Democratic Party and the fact that they don't really believe in real small-D democracy where competition is allowed and where voters get to choose between candidates that they that they like. Um, here's the last question I'll ask. So practically speaking, is part of your strategy to win what I've heard, for example, in another district where I talked to a progressive candidate, he pointed out 
that the incumbent who has been there forever, in the last primary, only 9% of peop the people, the registered voters, Democratic registered voters, came out to vote, 9%. And most people have never <laughs> heard of the incumbent, don't know his name, and probably don't know who he is or what he's done. And I wonder if that's part of your winning strategy to really knock on doors and reach out to people who are not engaged and really have no idea who the incumbent is. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people have no idea who their congressperson is because to them it doesn't really matter who you vote for because nothing changes. They still have to work three jobs. Each one is, you know, 20, 30 hours a week so that the employer doesn't have to quote unquote give you benefits. And then meanwhile, half their paycheck goes to childcare and it takes an hour to get to their job on the bus and all of this. So, like these daily realities don't change uh, for them depending on who they vote for. And they just see politicians who, you know, they take corporate money, they make these empty promises and nothing happens. And so there are a lot of people who are disenfranchised and don't feel represented by the system. And one great thing about Washington State is our voting system. You know, we have uh, all mail-in ballots, paper ballots. You don't register with a party. We have uh, top two open primaries. And we also newly have this year same-day registration. And so that's something that I'm going to, you know, you can register online, you can register the same day, you don't have to uh, declare loyalty to a party at all, especially not, you know, a year in advance or anything like that. So there are things like that where it makes it pretty easy to bring people in. You just have to show them that there's a reason to vote and show them, hey, look, like if you vote me in, I'm going to fight so that you or your kids can go to college for free so that you can get childcare for free, so that your school is just as good as the schools in the rich parts of town, that kind of thing, and really show people why I'm worth them voting for. And so definitely it'll be a lot of reaching out to people who have been disenfranchised from the system.